All right, so continuing with our final portion of Unit 6 for um, developmental psychology, we're going to talk about the development of morality uh, as we progress throughout life. Uh, there are a couple theories. Well, there's really just two uh, valid ones, at least partly valid, and a few criticisms we'll go over, um, and we'll start first with uh, the ideas established and the sequence established, the stages by a guy named Lawrence Colbert, uh, from the 1950s, when he, his field work started to about the 1970s, um, when he uh, when he passed. So, um, first, let's talk about what morality is really quickly. Um, morality itself is your sense uh, of what is right and wrong, as far as things that you do or think. What what is right and wrong? Sense of uh, right, not with the W, if I can spell right and wrong. So we're talking about justice here, at least a lead up to it. So believe it or not, if you can go back in your memory to when you were younger, uh, it wasn't as clear what things were good or bad or right or wrong. Um, it, to, to basically sum it up, what Kohlberg says, and I'll go through it in, in detail, when you're younger you basically start with this, um, I obey rules to avoid punishment, or I recognize that I can use them for my own advantage. Um, to either gain, gain reward or, or some other sort of self-interest. Uh, then you sort of move on to uh, extending uh, morality beyond just how you benefit or, or um, suffer uh, to society at large and how it affects other people and the reason why we have it to uh, keep people happy. And then the final stage, the more abstract stage, he talks more about our sense of understanding how values and morals and interests can vary between people so we have to establish uh, rules that provide a general protection and we form laws that are compromises between those interests. And then a, a further stage, uh, but also part of that stage would be um, forming your own personal universal ethic that um, sort of compels you to disobey laws that you feel are unjust, or, or sorry, are unjust, uh, even though they might be law and even though people might agree on them. Uh, and, and we'll go through that um, as we progress. But let me, let me give you an example here. Because you might think, oh, well, stuff that's right and wrong is easy, right? Well, it's actually not. Um, first of all, um, whether you're, you're going up abiding by your, your family rules and morals or the school or a religious set of morals, they vary quite a bit uh, from culture to culture. Certain things are, are taboo or outright considered immoral, dirty, banished. Uh, across the world, and it can, it's, we got wide ranges here from like, women can't come outside if they're on their periods, uh, to, you know, uh, women cannot read, you know, something like that, or, or show their face or their skin, that would be immoral and punishable. So we have a, a really wide and, well, on the extreme ends, uh, pretty uh, uh, repulsive range of, uh, of morals across the world that, that still exist. And if you don't think those exist, those exist in, uh, in, in a significant portion of the world, um, outside of the West at least. <clears throat> so, um, morality. Uh, let me give you a scenario uh, real quick, at least just to get you thinking about why this might not be as clear of an issue as uh, it might sound. So, right and wrong. Uh, most of us can agree that if you've got a person, we'll have that be person A, person A, and here's person B. All right, uh, person uh, B here uh, owns a store, and person A here doesn't own a store, uh, and he is going to uh, uh, rob person B, uh, steals his stuff without him knowing, maybe even uh, takes advantage of his trust, Maybe, maybe he's an employee at, at Person B's store. Um, and uh, in fact, let's say that he is. Um, he's actually an employee. That makes it a little more complicated. He's an employee and he is uh, stealing from the store of Person B. Uh, most of us would agree that probably the moral infraction, the one who's in the wrong here, is probably Person A. Uh, but it depends on the scenario. So what if, for example, I switch it to same scenario, but uh, person A steals from person B because person B is um, overworking them. They're not hiring enough help and um, they're not getting a, a, what they see as a fair amount of pay. Uh, they're struggling to pay bills and uh, person B is paying them uh, less than most other people in that profession but they, they feel like they, they can't go out and, 
and, and get a new job. They can't risk it. It might take them too long and they might lose their, their house or their rent or, or something like that. That might make it more complicated. I'm sure some of you still think that A would still be in the wrong, uh, but that might complicate it more if we make this person look more a little more sinister or, or greedy. Uh, it, it sort of makes it less obvious that this person is the one committing the moral infraction. Uh, if we take it a degree further than that, what if person A is uh, an employee of person B still? Uh, and, and let's say person B uh, is that sort of greedy, unhelpful, perhaps even unfair employer uh, who doesn't give them fair pay or hours or appreciation. And on top of that, person A has a wife or child that has a terminal illness like cancer or something like that. Or, or you know, well, let's, let's make it specific. They have some sort of condition that they are stuck in this chronic state of pain that they can't get out of. They're just in agony. Uh, and they can't afford the medical bills, so uh, to, to help ease their wife's suffering or their kid's suffering or their condition, whatever it might be, uh, they actually are uh, stealing from this guy slowly. Let's say he's a, he's a pharmacist, like he owns a, uh, a pharmacy. All right, pharmacy owner. All right, and he's stealing to, uh, uh, not, not even for, for uh, a selfish reason, he's doing it to because he can't afford it uh, to provide medication for his terminally ill um, son or, or daughter or wife or whoever it might be uh, or, or other partner who's suffering from chronic pain. Um, or maybe, maybe that medication could save their life but they can't afford it otherwise. Um, in that scenario, it's a lot harder to label this person as immoral. Again, some of you still might, uh, but it's not as clear cut as he's a robber, he's an innocent store owner. Now it's a little different. He's uh, a, a person of questionable character uh, and this is a this is somebody who's stealing not even on for themselves but to to reduce the suffering or, or treat a, a loved one who they can't afford the uh, money for. All right, uh, and we we can go endlessly with this. I'll I'll just do one more down on top of that. Let's say the scenario is person A is still stealing uh, to uh, acquire medicine for his terminally ill son or wife or or partner, whoever it might be. Uh, and, and this store owner isn't a bad guy. Uh, he's, he's a genuine person who, who pays him fairly uh, and all of that. But because person A is stealing this narcotic to give to his wife or son, whoever it might be, that actually person B gets in trouble uh, with the state because certain narcotics are highly regulated if it's like an amphetamine or an opioid or something like that. Um, you, there's there's uh, a lot of steps and procedures you have to go through to, to acquire these. You can't just write out prescriptions and collect them. They're actually tracked by the state. So if you're losing track or losing count or, or missing you know um, um, certain drugs, uh, that's going to get noticed. And that could actually get this person in trouble. They could be fined or thrown in prison because this person is stealing with them to save uh, their son or their daughter. So in that case, it makes it even more complicated as to who might be... Um, in the wrong here, or immoral. Um, so it, it's not quite as clear cut. However, if you were to ask a child uh, which one was wrong, they would almost all say person A is in the wrong because they're stealing from person B, uh, and of course that is something that is punishable, uh, and they're gonna see that. So that's that, that hopefully kind of puts into perspective how morality is not quite as simple as just, oh, this person's bad, this person's good. Uh, in fact, we'll actually get to the point that we realize that um, one's own perception of what is right and wrong can vary, which makes it even more complicated. So Kohlberg was one of the first ones to try to set out a, a stage of development similar to Piaget's. In fact, the um, ages line up rather well. I'm not gonna discuss the specific ages, but you can pretty much assume when I'm talking about this, I mean, the first stage for um, Kohlberg roughly lines up with sensory motor and um, uh, pre-operational stages for Piaget. Uh, conventional stage for Piaget lines up with the, um, um, or sorry, the uh, concrete uh, operational stage lines up with the conventional stage, and then the uh, uh, formal operational stage lines up here with the uh, um, post-conventional stage. So we'll go over these slowly. So first, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg was the uh, person who put forward this set of theories, uh, and he did it by uh, not Murray, Kohlberg. He did it by um, analyzing through survey uh, and, and lifetime development uh, of a whole bunch of uh, all males. That's going to be important for later. Uh, they are all men, but there it is a wide sample size. And also, I should mention before we go, and you dismiss everything he says, um, 
The first five stages out of six were, they have consistently passed replication tests. So there is a degree of uh, truth uh, or, or validity uh, to these, these stages, but we'll talk about what some of the criticisms are. So Lawrence Colbert uh, did his uh, research primarily from the 1950s to the 1970s. Unfortunately, he struggled with um, light depression, but he had some sort of, I forgot what, he had some sort of um, chronic condition that caused him an untold amount of, of pain or discomfort, so he eventually ended up uh, killing, committing suicide because he couldn't deal with the, the chronic uh, misery, but, um, so that's, that's particularly sad. But uh, he, he did establish the, uh, the foundations for, for uh, moral development and morality, which can also be a philosophical topic, but um, he's just analyzing the stages as far as how humans progress as their, their brain matures and the you know, physical components in their brain change and their, their behavior and ability uh, change along with it. So, uh, but the first part we did was more of a philosophical question as to who is right and who's wrong here. This again is just tra tracking the ability of somebody to, to make moral judgments. So, we have our first um, stage, and what's a little confusing is they have sub-stages. Um, I'm not gonna get too in-depth on them, but I will give you a general idea of what they are. So the first stage here uh, is what is called the um, uh, pre-conventional if I can spell chenal stage. Uh, these ones roughly align with Piaget's uh, sensory motor uh, and pre-operational stages. And what these are going to uh, constitute, so you could say roughly age, obviously, uh, you're probably thinking age two-ish here, um, perhaps younger, um, to mm, five, six, seven uh, or so. And uh, here you start forming your first understandings of what rules are, what right and wrong are, what, what rules are, and why to follow them. So stage one is the simplest one. Uh, this is the stage where, and again, there's, there's kind of two stages for each of these steps. Uh, so stage one of this is basically toddlers and, and, and two, three, four, five-year-olds. Uh, their primary concern here, I should make this a one system, it's a stage all. Uh, their primary concern is uh, avoiding punishment. Uh, they know that if, you know, their parents say, mm, no biting your brother, that if they bite their brother, they get, you know, time out or, or toys taken away or spanking, whatever it might be for the particular family, there's a punishment. So uh, their sense of morality is, I obey rules, not because I know what's right or wrong, but my only, you know, knowledge about what is right or wrong is, if I do this, I get in trouble, something bad happens to me. So I avoid it over time. And as they get older, that becomes a little easier for them to do. Uh, and as they're more towards the end of the stage, the five, six, seven range, they move on to uh, stage two, which isn't just that they follow rules to avoid punishment, uh, but there's a degree of self-interest involved here. Um, they realize that by following rules, um, things go more smoothly for them. Maybe they're rewarded for um, obeying rules, or they realize that um, having these rules allows them to do things um, that they might not otherwise be able to do. Um, so yes, I have to share with somebody, but if I don't share, then uh, I might not get any time at all. Certainly I might be punished for that, um, and I wouldn't get the toy that I'm waiting to share for or whatever. Uh, and they start understanding that they benefit from these rules. So not only are they avoiding punishment, but they actually themselves benefit from these rules. The, the, the sort of thing that breaks, separates the post-conventional stage from the next one, the conventional stage, is they don't extend rules to other people. They, they're not concerned with what happens to them, think, nor are they even capable of thinking because they're still a bit egocentric at this stage. Not entirely, but, but still somewhat, um, especially at the earlier parts of it. They are um, sort of uh, um, unable to realize how these actually benefit other people too. They really just think about their own self-interest. Oh, I don't wanna be punished for disobeying and I also uh, do benefit from these rules so it, it works out for me as far as obeying them uh, and abiding by them. All right, uh, so that's the pre-conventional stage. So it's very, very self-centered. Avoid the punishment or uh, benefit directly from the rules. All right, and then uh, you move on as you get into the age seven to about puberty range or so uh, is the conventional stage. Worth noting here is that uh, Kohlberg believed that these were, uh, how, how do I phrase this? These were, 
various orders of magnitude. So that probably didn't help. Uh, they are increasingly more complex. Uh, they're higher stages, meaning uh, you have to have a, a higher cognitive ability uh, to be able to understand the role of rules and the function of them and the application of them and what is right and wrong um, as you age. That's why you can't do it at a younger age and you slowly get better as you do age. Uh, and it's going to be important for, for later when we talk about um, some of the criticisms. So stage three and stage four are in here. And again, as you get closer to the end of this, you know, six or seven years old to about 11 or 12, about when puberty sets it in, you uh, are able to um, utilize uh, your frontal lobe as it, as it consolidates its connections uh, and you get a whole host of abilities. Um, it's going to start here with stage three, and this is where we are actually, for the first time, extending right and wrong and morality and rules and laws uh, to other people as well. So not only realizing the impact they have on us, but realizing the um, role and effect they have on others. So before you get to stage four, obviously you go to stage three because we're going to numerical order, but uh, stage three is more so about realizing rules uh, represent or... Oh, what's the word? Like reinforce, reinforce, represent. I'll just go for represent. Represent um, social uh, desirability. So they start understanding that maintaining rules makes other people like you more. Uh, so adults who are you know teachers or other friends, parents, or even your own parents they're gonna be much happier with you and nicer to you if you follow rules, if you are quote unquote a good boy or a good girl as opposed to a bad boy or a bad girl. Like they don't want their legacy to be, I'm a bad person and people don't like me, right? They wanna be known as the good person who follows rules and is consistent and is likable. Uh, so they're motivated. You could even say that's a little self-interested, but the point is they realize that these rules actually have ramifications uh, beyond just themselves. Like their reputation uh, is, is actually at stake. And that does involve other people uh, and they interact with that. And then the last developmental step, I guess you could say, going on to stage four here would be realizing the purpose of rules. So first of all, is to avoid punishment. Then you realize you benefit from them directly. Then you also realize that that extends to uh, other people and how they view you and, uh, and, and often motivates kids to be seen as uh, good or acceptable or likable as opposed to uh, bad or unlikable. Uh, but stage four, as they get closer to puberty, uh, this is where they understand the function of rules, function of rules and laws to maintain social order. Like there's a reason, they're not just arbitrary. Well, they actually are arbitrary as far as how we chose them, but we try to model these rules in a way that it actually makes people better off in the long run, as far as you know, allowing them to do what they want or succeed or flourish or be safe, and but still you know, be able to do what they want. Um, you understand that uh, it, it's more about social order than about avoiding punishment or seeming like a good boy or girl. It's actually there to benefit everyone, uh, meaning without rules, you might have bad guys or bad girls or bad people doing bad stuff. Um, so the fact that we have laws against robbery and, 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 and uh, violence and murders and things like that uh, is not to try to get back at the person that violated, like let's say you do have a person that's a robber or a killer or committed some sort of violent crime. Uh, the law doesn't like balance the universe as far as getting them back for what they did wrong. It's actually um, to make an example of them um, or anyone that does it uh, to discourage damaging or detrimental or what we consider bad behavior. So again, a, a law that punishes a criminal for killing somebody, um, that doesn't bring the person back that they killed or, or, or even out the balance of the universe. Uh, what that does is it actually makes people note that, oh, well, if I ever go off the rails uh, in a fit of rage or I want to get revenge on somebody, so I go out and kill them, I'm actually going to suffer for that or I'm likely to suffer for that. So that discourages them from engaging the behavior. So here, you more so understand uh, the function of rules for social or like, oh, it's not to balance the universe out or make people happy necessarily, um, although it kind of is to make people happy, at least safer. Um, it's, it's more so to discourage people from, from engaging in behaviors that we all agree are damaging or mostly they're damaging. Uh, and obviously talking about 
which rules to get rid of and which rules to keep uh, is more so of an abstract concept about thinking about the hypothetical consequences uh, for certain actions and what degree of punishment should be proportionally granted to a certain infraction. Like, obviously, we can agree that an equal punishment for, um, let's say, uh, uh, accidentally breaking your neighbor's window uh, and murdering somebody shouldn't be the same punishment. One is uh, uh, far greater than the other. Even if you did it intentionally, let's say you did do it intentionally, you're angry at your neighbor and you broke the window to get back at him. Um, the punishment for that should not be as severe as you intentionally killing somebody uh, for, for revenge, right? There should be some degree of proportionality. So we're not, we haven't got there yet. That's the next stage where you're uh, abstractly analyzing um, various consequences and, and proportional uh, severity. But that's sort of where uh, the stage where you extend your understanding of rules to other people, uh, how it makes them feel, what pleases them, uh, and ends up benefiting you, and then also uh, the purpose of them, and that they are there for everybody to make everybody better off. Um, but we haven't talked about which rules and how to analyze them. And that's going to be uh, stage, um, the, the third stage here, which of course is two substages for five and six, uh, and that's going to be the post-conventional stage. So considering that this is roughly adolescence and onward, and obviously the older you get into your 20s and even 30s with more experience anyway, but certainly your 20s with the frontal lobe development, uh, the better you get at this. Um, so this is again going to be about 12-ish uh, to adulthood. Um, obviously you're going to be uh, progressing in ability uh, at least up until your late 20s, and then of course adding on experience and perspective in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and onward. Um, but this is where you start to analyze what rules should be set uh, and what rules are actually good or not good. So uh, here is stage five, and then we'll go to stage six. Important to note, I think I might have already mentioned it, I'm just going to say it again now. Uh, the first five stages here, well, maybe not entirely correct, and we'll, and we'll get to that. Um, they are all going to be tested, uh, and they are going to pass uh, replication testing later by other teams of researchers. So these are valid to a degree. Not entirely correct in and of themselves, but certainly this basic progression or the possibility of this basic progression and ability to think about them these ways uh, is true. Stage six, though, is a bit trickier. People don't deny that it exists because it does exist, but it doesn't necessarily exist, and it certainly doesn't exist for all people. And on top of that, um, it's a little inconsistent individual to individual. So when we get here, just understand that people don't, even if they get to this point, they don't always abide by these sets of morals or standards. Sometimes they sort of fall back into the more, uh, I guess you could say, primitive or elementary understandings of morality and rules. So stage five is the, um, this is going to be the toughest one to get across to you guys, I think. This is the stage concerned with what's called social contracts. If you are familiar with any sort of history or AP history, uh, you know what a social contract is. Social contracts are essentially the, they're an idea coming out of the Enlightenment. They're very abstract in that they form the fundamental basis for lawmaking, individualism, and natural rights uh, in the West and, and the rest of the world. And by the way, that isn't just a Western belief. Uh, when um, the, the multiple times, including the first uh, Universal Human Rights Declaration for the United Nations, the multiple times that all countries in the world, regardless of their Western affiliation or, or other cultural affiliation, they all pretty much agree on, on the idea of natural rights and human rights and extending those to, to women and minorities and children and things like that. So don't think that this is just a purely Western idea. Uh, that would not be true. Almost universally, countries agree to it. Now, uh, certain governments actually abiding by those uh, terms that they, that they overwhelmingly agreed to. That's the question that's up in the air for even Western uh, countries. But uh, nonetheless, don't just think this is some radical Western idea that only applies to the West, because actually most people in the world, regardless of culture, agree with a lot of these fundamentals. So, social contracts. This is the idea that, how can I phrase this? Um, individuals, so all people, uh, vary in their personal values, we'll, we'll, we'll say that, personal values, and, and even morals, perhaps. 
So what's an example? Well, I would bet that a lot of you on that earlier example we had where I gave you multiple instances of the, the employee stealing from the store owner and how the details of the story actually probably changed, in fact I know it changed at least somewhat, changed your, the range of difficulty required to label one as good or bad in that scenario. Uh, and that's going to vary not just for you, but actually person to person. Because depending on my values, I'm more likely to side perhaps with the uh, employee uh, or I'm more likely to side with the store owner based on my own actual set of values, perhaps upbringing, uh, certainly genetic predispositions, which we'll, which we'll talk about later. But you have to understand that people like different things, they have different views and different values. So in understanding that I can't just say, I've thought about this a lot and this is a universally good thing. That might not be true, uh, and, in, and it almost certainly isn't, uh, because we do, of course, have psychopaths and sociopaths in the world that have no concern for other people, or perhaps even like inflicting harm upon other people. Uh, so that right away makes it automatically uh, not universal. Nonetheless, this realizes that everybody has uh, inherent value of, them, of their own, but also that uh, their values and morals and perspectives are different. So the question becomes, well, how do we make rules for a bunch of individuals who uh, have different values? Well, first of all, we try to find common values that we all share, or at least by majority. Uh, and this is how we, we form constitutions and things like the uh, uh, American Bill of Rights, um, where we try to find a bunch of things we all agree on uh, that would provide a net of protection for everybody, but still allow them to vary on their own perspectives, values, and morals. Uh, so here's where you have ideas like natural rights, like, what are all the fundamental things we can guarantee to people, uh, even if their values are going to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for, vary, are, are going to vary. So I think most of us can agree that people should have a right to life, so we shouldn't be able to just uh, kill people at will. Uh, if you are going to take somebody's life, it should be for a, a legitimate reason, like they're serial murderer or rapist or something like that. And even then, some people don't think it's right to uh, um, use the uh, death sentence, even though they, some people might think that they can be rehabilitated or they should spend their life in prison or, or whatever it might be. Um, most of us can agree that people should have the right to liberty, to do what they want, so they shouldn't be, you know, having their marriage partners selected for them by their parents. They shouldn't be um, disallowed from uh, uh, or excluded from certain jobs because they're a man or a woman. Um, things like that, liberty, like you being able to do what you want at least so long as you aren't damaging other people. So, you know, do pursuing the job that I want to pursue, uh, certainly in adulthood, M uh, marrying or not marrying um, in adulthood, and, and if I do marry, marry who I want. Um, those, those are the decisions, uh, the basic liberties that should be uh, allowed to people. And then uh, most people also agree that private property is a fundamental right. Not all people do, uh, certainly. More people towards the uh, um, fringes of the uh, uh, left-wing uh, left part of the uh, spectrum, side of the spectrum, of course, for you, this would be left, um, are against private property and they have their reasons. Uh, but most people agree that, you know, if you've worked for something uh, and built it, that that is yours. And people don't have the right to just come in and take it from you or take the credit for it. Uh, that you deserve the credit for that or the reward. Or you at least deserve the right to keep it to yourself and you don't have to uh, share it with others uh, or uh, let others take it from you. So those are just some basic ones, natural rights that we generally agree on. Um, so to form these, um, and I'm really getting into this one because I feel pretty strongly about it, but to form these, um, you basically have a, a, a democratic uh, system or state. That's what a social contract is, is where everyone comes together, and again, they try to agree on what are some common things that we want to protect for everybody. Even if not every person agrees with it, we want to find that most people agree with these things, and we protect these things, and we, and we try to limit it. Uh, and then we, we go, and as things pop up, we try to address them and change them or not change them uh, as things come up. But certainly, if it's democratic, no one's ever going to get exactly what they want. It's going to be uh, a form of compromise. Uh, and you have sort of the premise here of uh, do the thing that is that makes the most people happy or the greatest good. And certainly there are troubles there. You could have the um, oft-mentioned uh, you know, tyranny of the majority, where if you've got, you know, two-thirds of people at least, they can kind of do whatever they want, and the other third of people kind of just have to deal with it. Um, but, you know, it's worked out pretty well in the West for the most part. Um, there are some hiccups and some, there is some snaking in the, uh, um, the, the moral progress line, certainly. But uh, I think over time we've largely improved across the last 
100, 200, certainly 300 years. Regardless, that's what stage five is. It's to understand that other people have different values, so we have to come together and as a, as a, in a democratic fashion, generally speaking, um, compromise and decide which ones we all want to protect so that we can all go about our own lives practicing the things that we want to do and, and living life according to our own values, not stopped or hindered by others. All right, that's stage five. And again, these have all sort of passed replication. Again, this is a pretty um, successful mold that the, the, the West has, has stumbled upon. Uh, and again, most of these fundamentals, even if you're outside of Western society, uh, the world has signed on to them as a, a generally universally agreed upon mm, standard. Stage six, though, this is the one that's a bit fishy in that it fails to pass replication because it's tough, tough to find somebody who lives by this, this, this ethical code. And this is uh, forming an individual universal ethic. So this is, you sort of think about the world and, and how it works and what people should do, and it's certainly yourself, uh, and you form your own moral ethical code. Um, and I don't mean, you know, what interests me the best. Uh, this is implied that you're supposed to be extending it to your own behavior, ob behavior, obviously, but what you feel is generally a universal ethic that is as closest to this mold as possible. But it might be more specific than just, you know, a few natural rights that are protected. Um, so according to this, you actually are obligated to disobey laws that do not align with your individual universal ethics. So you act to your own moral code, according to it. And we're again, we're gonna assume here that uh, you have gone through this stage and believe in these principles that um, actions should be not only beneficial for yourself, but for others and should consider the rights and values of other people. Nonetheless, uh, this would be an example of somebody who forms this universal personal moral, moral code uh, and lives by it wholly, meaning they will refuse to obey any laws they see as um, unjust. Uh, and, and you can easily look at history, even contemporary society, and find laws that are laws and are certainly punishable. And maybe even were formed by a consensus, um, a democratic consensus at some point in time. Uh, but they are what you would consider, certainly individually, but possibly by a majority, uh, unjust. Uh, one example might be in the 1950s uh, in, in, uh, in, in the southern part of the United States, we had segregation laws that made it, you know, illegal uh, for colored people to uh, go to... Um, white schools and use white restrooms and they had like colored people only seating in parks and things like that uh, and even though it was the law in the south uh, you had to obey the law because otherwise you of course would be uh, punished for that uh, but you had conscientious objectors people that were aware of the consequences but obviously felt it violated uh, and it certainly did by the way violate the natural rights that we have um, uh, protected here in the United States that disobeying those laws was actually the right thing to do that not that not abiding by their own ethic and obeying these unjust laws like segregation laws for example um, that they were morally wrong they would feel guilty they would feel shame uh, so it was actually their duty to go out and disobey these laws intentionally and obviously they made a, a, a good plan about it you know basing their strategies off of the civil disobedience of, of Gandhi and, and run primarily by Martin Luther King and his uh, cohorts um, successfully and justly. Uh, they were, of course, able to do this in mass and sort of make an example of it to the United States and make the rest of the world aware, certainly the rest of the United States aware that this segregation existed and there were certain individuals that were uh, very much uh, motivated to maintain it, uh, that it should be torn down. And it shouldn't just be torn down just because the civil rights movement thought it should, but it actually did not coincide with our own uh, natural rights codes and, and, and constitutional protections. Uh, but that's an example of somebody forming their own universal ethical code, and despite the fact that these laws exist and they've been functioned and put into place, maybe even by a majority at one point in time, that it's actually their duty to uh, disobey them and live by what they feel uh, is actually just. And what, before I, we get into the whole subjectivity and you know, uh, morally relativistic or even morally nihilistic uh, um, um, perspectives here, um, I, I wanna make the point clear that when they're talking about the stage, they're not talking about form your own moral code, whatever it might be, you know, it is what it is to you. They generally mean something that's aligned with this. So you're not just out for you uh, or people that look like you or believe the same stuff as you. 
it's implied that you're supposed to be attempting to live out an ethic that is best for everyone. And that if those laws don't align with your, your view of what that is, you should disobey them. Uh, and certainly by not disobeying them and going against your own moral code and, and, and maybe obeying the laws that were segregation in the 1940s and 50s, you would feel guilty and you'd feel shame for that even though nobody punished you. So again, you don't care about the punishment or you don't care about the social order. You believe that um, certain laws may not align with these beliefs in stage five, so it's your duty actually to disobey them or certainly get them changed. Um, moral duty to disobey laws seen as unjust. All right, so that's probably way more explanation than you actually needed for this. Uh, but that is the basic stage of development. And again, most of it's confirmed by replication. Uh, this one, to a large degree, <clears throat> doesn't mean it's non-existent, but it's not as concise or consistent or clear. Uh, certainly not replicable uh, consistently uh, as the other five. But the other five are pretty, pretty communicable uh, <clears throat> as far as their presence around the world, even outside of Western cultures. All right, so let's move on to the critics. There were several criticisms. I think I have room here on my screen. I think I got this much room-ish. Hopefully I do. <clears throat> we'll find out afterwards, I suppose. Um, critics of this um, sequence or this, this set of stages. Um, we had a couple, so let's get them here. First objections were, of course, that stage six wasn't uh, able to be replicated, but the first five might have been. Um, but um, what was the one I was trying to think about? Well, I'll just put that for now while I think. Not fully uh, replicated. And they're referring mostly, of course, to stage six. Um, so that was an issue. We also had, um, what else did we have? Oh, we had, uh, it was uh, Eurocentric or, or based upon Western ideals, Western uh, ideal oriented. So it was perhaps culturally biased, but we'll put that culturally biased. Uh, and perhaps it is or was, but um, critics of those critics have pointed out that, number one, uh, almost all nations of the world signed on to uh, certainly the stage five set of beliefs. Um, so critics of critics, or I guess we just put proponents. Proponents of Kohlberg. So it's, not, it's, it's important not only to know the uh, criticisms, but uh, the... the evidence and support of as well. And then of course you can form your own opinion on where you align. But opponents argued that uh, not only did uh, uh, these were generally universal among cultures, uh, but they also argued that even though it might have been Western and individuals focused, not as focused on the community or, 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 or groups or the collective, uh, that um, looking at the data, that if you look at cultures that actually abide by certainly stage five, uh, most of them, of course, being Western nations, that uh, you'll actually find that people are generally happier, uh, more successful, healthy, etc., uh, and they are usually more free to as far as their own uh, personal liberty. Like, they can go out and say whatever they want for the most part. They'll be criticized, certainly, by other people, uh, but they won't be punished for that. Um, you know, women have equal access to all things legally. The uh, same with uh, minority groups, uh, by law, by the way. And yeah, there might be some social element or social pressures regionally, uh, that might make that more difficult, but there's no laws uh, in the United States, and, and as far as I know, almost every other Western uh, nation, since at least the 90s when they outed apartheid in South Africa, that actually systematically, explicitly uh, works against people based on some sort of group identity. Um, so they argued that as well. Um, they argued for, argue in favor of Western society it's affluence. And I don't just mean wealth, by the way. I, I mean healthiness, 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 happiness uh, across the board, innovation, technology, etc. cetera. Uh, and again, the, probably the best marker though is the fact that almost all world nations uh, agreed to these, these fundamentals uh, as far as UN charters go. All right, uh, and the uh, loudest critic that uh, came um, was, I don't mean loud as an annoying, I mean like, a, um, this one got the most attention because she was actually, I believe she was an assistant of, of, of Kohlberg and worked on these stages. Uh, this came from a um, 
psychological uh, uh, professor known as Carol Gilligan. And she argued, and she did her uh, field work primarily from the 1950s, and I think her last publications were in the 1980s. Um, I think she's still alive too, which is cool. Um, but she uh, opposed Kohlberg's um, hypotheses, at least partially, uh, because they were, um, uh, I believe the word is androcentric. Uh, it means that they're overly focused on masculine perspectives uh, uh, and view, views and values of the world. Um, so it, it sort of favored men. In fact, I, mean, I think we mentioned it in here. Uh, initially, he only interviewed and tracked the development of men. And well, we, we did find out, by the way, that this actually was also true for uh, quite a few women, too. Uh, at the, initially, it wasn't um, clear because we only had data from, from men. So it was a uh, masculine... Uh, value-centered, meaning they were focused much more on, on abstract rules, um, justice itself, uh, laws, social order, uh, etc., uh, and not on views that were, what's the word I'm looking for, generally valued by, by females. Not all females, though, I just mean on average. We can certainly have males that agree with these stuff, things, too. Uh, but things that were feminine, why couldn't I think of that? Um, she argued that most women, females, uh, favored a, a feminine perspective on morality. And you might think, well, what might that be? Um, I believe she labeled it, or maybe somebody else labeled it, but I think she labeled it in her book, um, what is referred to as the ethics of care. So while this is very much concerned about fairness and justice and law and, and, and abstractly applying that to all people, sort of systematically, not thinking about how people feel about it, but, but how it actually practically plays out, um, Gilligan argued that uh, a more feminine perspective on, on morality, uh, or a more female-based pers perspective, but again, not exclusively female, because uh, you have definitely have some females that might side with this and males that might side with this, but ethics of care meant that it was focused more on Morals, morality focused more on um, personal care, certainly, nurturing, empathy, um, typical feminine characteristics, empathy, uh, care for others. So like how happy are people, are they suffering, uh, what can we do to ease that suffering? Um, and then uh, cultivating personal relationships. So not doing things that would upset people. Uh, in an attempt to keep, mm, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To keep relations smooth uh, and uh, people generally, generally happy. All right. Um, so that was her point, and um, there's a few issues with this. Uh, in fact, by the way, the feminist community was not a fan of this uh, in the '70s when it when it first came out in the '80s. Uh, so most feminists oppose this because they uh, believe that. Uh, these views that she was espousing were actually patriarchal because women only believed that because it was socially uh, constructed uh, and, and, and they were indoctrinated to um, be people that were more polite and focused on pleasing others and caring for others and interpersonal relationships and that that wasn't a function of the female brain but it was really just a, a cultural influence that's been indoctrinated across the years. Uh, and of course, we know now, at least since the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of studies are showing that that certainly does exist to an extent, but the, that is far less influenced by society and far more influenced by uh, genetics, um, uh, gender differences, which we talked about in one of the previous lectures, I think it was two previous lectures ago, uh, as well as um, environmental um, 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 factors, uh, like, and I don't mean society, I mean like um, epigenetic effects, like hormone exposure, uh, exposure to certain uh, uh, or lack of exposure to, to nutrients as you're as you're growing gestating or, or out of the womb um, those are a much those have a much larger causal impact on um, uh, the general views of, of men and women regarding masculinity and femininity uh, and of course we know it's very clear that individuals vary but on average that is that is certainly true so uh, feminists opposed as a social construction, um, but we do know that um, that has largely been uh, disproven, or 
not even disproven fully, because obviously society has some degree of impact, but it's been, um, its significance has been substantially reduced. Um, the genetic and uh, hormonal and other environmental factors that are not socially, socioculturally related make up uh, like 75, 80, I think even upwards of 90% of the determinism as far as people's personal likes uh, and, and femininity and masculinity uh, per individual. Uh, so largely a genetic plus environmental um, uh, causal relationship. Um, but even Gilligan herself um, was quick to, I don't want to say silence the critics, but, but certainly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? slow down their criticisms or, 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 or quiet down the noise. Uh, because Gilligan, po Gilligan pointed out that not only she expected this sort of reaction, but um, uh, so some critics, for example, pointed out that her findings fail replication, or her, her proposition. But she quickly made the point that she wasn't trying to propose some replicatable theory. She was merely trying to um, open up the conversation, which of course is in psychology or, or any field is a wonderful thing. You always want to have um, uh, opinions that disagree because it makes you figure out if this is actually true or not instead of just taking it as true uh, and the data. If you actually seek different, if you're skeptical and, and seek different explanations and go out and test them, uh, that's what we want because we want to make sure that whatever we think about the world and how it works, we're actually as close to correct as, as we can or at least we find all of the relevant factors, not just assuming it's one but oh really it's a combination of like five things. Uh, and, and then, the, of course, the argument becomes what percentage of that causality is, is, a, is, a, is a result of those five factors. So it failed replication, but then she also pointed out, um, um, but she mentioned, uh, it wasn't meant to be like uh, an alternate theory. It was merely her questioning the methods and thinking about alternate perspectives. Uh, so not necessarily that, that she's right and she's got a bunch of data to back this up, but uh, perhaps this isn't a completely correct analysis and we should think about it differently and, 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 and try to analyze other factors too. But she mentioned uh, ethics of care, of care, not intended as a stand alone uh, theory. So I think why they actually include it here on the actual AP test, because again, this isn't a um, replicatable uh, theory, but, but they are trying to point out that psychology has been cognizant of the objections of others, whether it was a cultural bias or a male masculinity-centered bias. Uh, and even if those might not be entirely correct, um, this has been, been tried and, and alternate voices have arisen uh, and proposed alternate theories um, uh, up to this point. All right, so that's the uh, basic set of criticisms, but there's one more that I want to uh, highlight. This is an important one. This is a pretty recent one too, by the way, uh, and it's more along the lines with individuals who were not satisfied with um, the sort of inconsistent replication, certainly of stage six, but also people pointed out things too, like this, I'm, I'm gonna erase these now and use this space. One of the common criticisms was, uh, aside from the stage six not being uh, replicatable, at least not as much as the first five stages, was that um, there was a bit of inconsistency. Even if you did have these stages of development as far as what people are capable of understanding, people don't always act by that. So just because you progress beyond stage one or, or, or two uh, or three, that doesn't mean that people purely abide by that. Oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, one of the reasons why Carol Gilligan spoke up is because Lawrence Colbert said that most women, he said most, but certainly uh, um, he uh, drew the ire uh, of, of, of the, the female community for saying this. He believed that most girls did not progress beyond stage three or four, and, and mostly it was a male thing, which is why he said he only analyzed men in his studies. So uh, she was definitely right to object to that. Uh, and at least look into that. Uh, and we certainly do know that women are capable of, uh, just because they're women, that they're, they're not confined to being relegated to stage three or four developmentally, and that that's a, a, a lower stage necessarily. Um, but I forgot to mention that, that she did object to that on that grounds. And certainly women are capable of going just as far as men, 
um, just like uh, IQ or personality. Even if one group averages differently, you still have individuals that can be all over the spectrum. Uh, nonetheless, they were not happy, happy with this uh, failure of not only to replicate, but this inconsistency. So here's an example. Somebody might um, gravitate beyond um, stage two, which is um, rules that are, are only uh, abided by for self-interest. So let's take, for example, the drunk driving rule. Um, me obeying that or not might be predicated upon, upon me wanting to avoid punishment, so for stage one, or um, me uh, trying to get away with it uh, because it doesn't benefit me. Uh, so, for example, let's say somebody did um, drive somewhere far and uh, they drank too much, so they're intoxicated. So we actually know, by the way, I think we've discussed this before, that being drunk itself actually impairs your judgment, so you might actually think you're okay to drive when you're not actually, or even if you are aware that you're not, you don't care about the consequences. Nonetheless, um, people can jump from, even though they understand stage four and they understand that these rules like drunk driving rules are there for the protection of everybody and the maintenance of social order, but they might just on a whim totally disobey it uh, because, well, that's too bad because I need to get home. What am I supposed to do? not go home and I have work tomorrow and, and all of that. And so then they drive home drunk and then they get in a wreck or they get arrested or, or whatever it might be. Right, maybe they hurt themselves and yeah, maybe you don't care because they chose it, but they might hurt somebody else. In fact, that happens quite frequently. When they do crash, they hurt other people, which is why we have the laws for the most part. But they, they might make these jumps just randomly. So even though I understand the function of rules up to stage four, I might hop back on my, on my abiding by those rules uh, and just focus on the self-interest portion or only not do something because I fear punishment, and if I think I can get away with it, I'll, I'll get away with it. So people hop from stage four to stage two, and then back to stage four, and then back to stage one, uh, only you know, obeying because they can get away with it. If they don't think they'll get caught, they try to get away with it, or they only care about rules that benefit them, and, and they don't care about them extending to others, even though they understand that uh, those rules are extended to others. So this is true, and we all, we all see this. This is why people break rules, <clears throat> even if they understand their function. Uh, so that was one of the biggest criticisms, like, well, People can understand these things, but they don't actually abide by them. So why is that? Uh, if I understand up to stage four at this point in my life or stage five, why do I choose to break those rules anyway? Um, so one of the answers in a more complete perspective or, 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 or description uh, of <clears throat> moral development comes from uh, Jonathan Haidt and his research. Um, so we talk to this guy all the time, um, but this is one of his first and uh, largest contributions. So this goes back to, I, I think this is what was his doctoral thesis work was on, or at least initially it was, was about <clears throat> morality uh, across culturally. Uh, so not only do they have some interesting findings that first of all, morality is mostly based on one's disgust levels. So most rules in the world, especially the more primitive ones are based on uh, taboos and norms that um, have to do with finding things disgusting or not, um, which is why we have such ridiculous rules like, uh, or have had ridiculous rules in the past, or even do, do still in some parts of the world, like like I've mentioned before, women can't come out into public if they're on their period, or or they can't show their skin, and all, all these weird things. Or they can't eat certain foods, even though there's nothing wrong with the food, or they can't eat a certain food on a certain day, even though there's nothing wrong with the food on that day. Um, Jonathan Haidt noticed um, that even though Kohlberg did this wonderful job of laying out this rationalization of, of us figuring out what morals are and then living according to the ghost codes, even if we understand how those laws work, when we get to stage four or five or even six, we don't actually live them out that way. We might be aware of them and, and, and be uh, aware of why we have them and set them up that way, but people disobey those rules all the time. Uh, and more importantly, people think that they are not breaking the rules. So this is a weird one. So uh, it's very, very common for criminals, even though there's a whole host of evidence that they committed the crime, even up to like video footage and DNA evidence and all this stuff, they will be convinced that they are innocent or someone framed them um, because they don't actually rationally think about rules. We, unfortunately, but fortunately when we realize what it is, we unfortunately uh, do not adhere strictly to a rational 
moral code. What do I mean by that? That's kind of what I mentioned before. You might be able to understand rules and their purposes and how to apply them and how to form a, uh, a, a morally sound set of cool codes and laws, not cool codes and laws. But uh, Hype figured out that, yeah, we might know that, but we don't actually do that in practice. Uh, what we actually do is uh, we are, we, our actions anyway, our actions are largely dictated, dictated by instant, or nearly instant, emotional or intuition-based decisions. So what do I mean by that? I mean, most of what we do is based on what we want to do or not. This internal feeling we have instantaneously about something, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's okay for me to do this or not. Uh, and what you'll find is many, many, many people make themselves the exceptions to rules because of this. So what they do, and again, we think that we have these logical brains that, you know, we're these robots that live our lives based on um, our understanding of the world rationally and abide, abiding by these logical rules and, and forming these moral codes, and, and we do. But that's actually the minority of our behavior. Most of it, upwards of 90%, um, so anywhere from you know, 80 to 90% uh, of our actions are uh, actually based on our instantaneous intuitive judgments. So let me give you an example. Um, what was the example? I don't want to give a, I can only think of the inappropriate examples he had. What was an example I, that he had? Okay, here's an example. Um, I believe one of the examples he had was people had to give a judgment on whether something was right or wrong. And um, one of the questions was, and this is for Western people, um, they talked about how, um, okay, I remember the story. This family uh, had a family dog, and you're probably like, oh, I don't, know where, I don't like where this is going, and you probably won't. Uh, they had this family dog, and um, they lived with it, and it was wonderful, it lived 12 years, the kids grew up with it, it was great, and then one day the, uh, the dog died, right? It died, we'll say, of natural causes. All right, um, so it died and, and of course they, they grieved the dog and they were sad. Um, and so when the dog died uh, and they, they were in the grieving process, they actually uh, uh, butchered it and prepared it, uh, cooked it. So uh, it was completely and 100% safe. No one got sick. It was all sanitary, fully cooked. They ate it. Uh, no one suffered any parasites or any sort of bacterial infection or virus. Everything was fine. The dog didn't suffer. Uh, it died naturally and happily. The people grieved it and they ate it. No one was harmed by this, nobody. No one saw it and was traumatized, nothing like that. And then they were asked, was that moral or immoral? And overwhelmingly, people uh, rated that as an immoral act, despite the fact that no one suffered, uh, that uh, nobody uh, was harmed by it negatively. Like I said, no, no parasites, no cancer, no, no other sort of other forms of germs that affect them negatively. Uh, they utilized as much of it as they could. They buried the rest. Nothing was harmed. No environmental damage. Nothing. Uh, they found that people would overwhelmingly say it was immoral, and then when they would ask why, uh, people could not, people could not describe it. Uh, people could not tell them why. They'd just be like, well, I don't know. I, I just know it's wrong. Uh, and that's because most of our moral judgments are are run that way. We have this instantaneous reaction. Uh, to things that we find appalling or, you know, things that might favor us um, uh, in our own self-interest. And uh, instead of us abiding by our rational rules, we actually live our lives by majority with these instantaneous uh, intuition-based judgments. Uh, and what we use our rationality for is uh, we actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, utilize our uh, uh, rational or conscious uh, brain or thought uh, to justify what we've already decided without thinking about it. So it's basically just there to rationalize thought uh, to justify slash rationalize our intuitions. Uh, so he gave another example too, a, a more common one. Uh, he gave the example of one day he was uh, getting ready for work and he's getting ready to go. And his wife's having a hard time um, with their child. Uh, their child like spilled or threw up or something. Uh, and she asked, no, no, it wasn't even that, it wasn't that difficult. It was actually, there was a bunch of garbage and it was even already tied up. And his wife asked him, 
hey, could you take the garbage out before you go to work? Uh, and um, he confessed that he had initial resistance to that. Like he just immediately was like, oh no, I can't, I, have, I, I'm, I gotta go to work, I'm gonna be late. Uh, and after he left and he's driving to work, he realized, uh, well, that was a lie actually. He was not late for work. Taking the garbage out would not have made him late for work. It wouldn't have gotten him dirty or anything like that. He'd been just fine. Um, but he made the decision instantaneously with judgment. He was like, ugh, I don't wanna do that. So we immediately came up with a reason why he couldn't do it. And then of course the wife's like, okay. And then you know, she took the crash and had the kids do whatever she did. Um, but that got him thinking about, well, that wasn't moral, that was actually immoral. Uh, but I rationalized it um, as something that was moral and okay for me. And only upon thinking about it later did I realize that, oh, that wasn't actually moral. Uh, so again, he's largely found, and, and again, this has been replicated multiple times uh, by multiple studies. This is about as hard of a fact in social science as you can find, that again, we make our most of our decisions based on instant judgments that we have, this in, intuitive feeling. Uh, and we don't actually use logical thought to uh, guide our actions. We actually commit the actions based on our instant judgments and feelings, and then we use our rational brain to describe why we did it, rationalize it. Uh, and the problem with this is most of our rationalizations are justifying why we did something, even if it was actually immoral. Um, they abide uh, by self-interest, first of all, or in support of our own feelings, even if we don't understand them. Self-interest or, or, or innate support. Uh, but also that uh, even if you find something, some evidence uh, against your case, like let's go back to that dog example where the family cooked and eat, ate the dog that died of natural causes and nothing, nothing bad happened to anybody. Um, in that case, nobody could come up with a reason why, but they still, uh, I just said, no, I, I just, it's wrong, I wouldn't do it, they shouldn't do it, I feel like it's wrong. Uh, we actually, that's actually belief perseverance, technically, but uh, even if people find evidence against our actions, our rationalizations for why we do things or why things are wrong or not, uh, we find that people succumb to the uh, confirmation bias uh, drives our rationalization. Uh, so he goes a step further and says, well, each person, and this is largely true based on personality, we, this is psychometrically sound as well, based on the big five, which is what we'll talk about in unit seven. Uh, but people have these genetic predispositions as far as what they prefer. It doesn't mean they're absolutely going to do those things, but things that you like and things you feel are right, or information you feel is right, um, or good, or bad, uh, those are kind of natural. We, we kind of have these internal... I know I shouldn't point here because it's up here. We have these internal uh, predispositions where we favor a certain view or a certain action or a certain value. Uh, and so since we have those predispositions to think that way, or I don't even think that way, have those intuitions, those internal judgments, uh, we basically live our whole lives justifying why we feel that way. And confirmation bias, as we talked about in our, our section on cognition, this is a judgment error uh, uh, or a thinking error. This is where you have a feeling or a thought or a proposition and you accept all incoming information that supports it, but anything that disproves it, you uh, dismiss or toss out or, or disregard, right? And humans are largely uh, big confirmation bias uh, filters. So we have these intuitive beliefs that may be genetically driven or largely are uh, as far as ways we prefer or feel are right or like. And then we find ways to uh, disclude or exclude, um, uh, exclude is the right word, exclude uh, relevant information that goes against it. And we, of course, accept anything that supports it, even if it might be shaky evidence. Um, it's actually really, really hard for you to, first of all, be aware that you are not making decisions rationally, recognize what those uh, intuitions actually are, and then correctly not engage in this confirmation bias. So not just exclude information you don't like because it doesn't support you and include only information that you do like because it does support you. So while it's very, very difficult, and even though most people never realize this throughout their entire lives and they go on uh, birth to death, that living uh, by this uh, um, sort of uh, natural biological uh, network or process, uh, you actually can use your rational mind uh, to change that over time. It's not instant. 
and you'll be fighting your feelings for quite a bit, but you can actually change people's mind through conversation. So uh, it is possible, but difficult, possible to adjust uh, moral slash intuitive preferences, like the stuff you naturally sort of prefer, uh, through open debate, uh, open debate, um, uh, new information, uh, or uh, um, just having an open mind, really. Discovering that, oh, uh, that's how my brain works. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe I should really listen to the other side, even though I feel like it's wrong. Maybe there's a whole bunch of evidence that goes against what I said. I'm only picking out the couple of things that exist to support me. It's like, well, so we're left, where we left off, um, you might actually come to realize if you're open to it and you're genuinely listening to what the other side has to say, that you might be wrong, uh, or you uh, listen to new information, you might realize actually that, oh, well, there's a whole bunch of evidence that goes against what I say. Like there's like 20 studies that show um, what I think is wrong uh, and only one study that actually confirms what I, what I feel and, and believe is correct. Um, or maybe I'm only basing my um, opinions uh, or evidence on anecdotal things that you know, uh, don't have large sample sizes, it's just one instance that might be uh, a, uh, uh, an outlier. Um, uh, it might be something that, 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 that hardly ever happens. Uh, it could be uh, um, anything that's experience-based that's not actually a representation of, of, of that has a, a large experimental sample size or, or, or goes through the experimental process. Um, nonetheless, uh, you, might, you might realize that and then actually be able to sort of forcibly uh, change your mind uh, through using your rational brain. So even though you might have that impulse, that feeling initially, you'll, you'll be able to rein yourself and be like, wait, 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 I know that's actually not right. I know that the evidence is overwhelmingly against that and so I should actually um, speak out against this for myself, maybe to others around me, or at least abide by the rules that I know are true um, according to um, you know, the, the, the social patterns uh, laid out and, and tested um, in psychological studies, <clears throat> or the overwhelming on them. Um, maybe an example would help. So the last thing I'll talk about for this, there's an example about how you could go through this process. So let's take um, something that is uh, sort of something that you inherit, uh, a personal preference, a predisposition. And again, a predisposition means that you're not always gonna go this way and you can go the other way, but you favor uh, a view, uh, whatever it might be. So I've read the years, by the way, he's 1980s uh, to present, he's still going, thankfully, putting out a lot of good stuff for all of us. Um, let's go to an example. So let's say that, here's a common one, male or female. Um, let's say that you are predisposed genetically, like you favor, uh, to uh, uh, favor compassion um, in parenting. Let's just say that. All right, we talked about this before. So let's say, uh, you know, you've got a, uh, we'll just use the typical example. And again, this might not be true, we're just gonna use the averages. You could have the reverse of this, or both parents are compassionate. Let's just, let's just, Play the averages here and say uh, the father in this scenario is is less compassionate and a little more um, I don't even say strict but uh, uh, a little less sheltering and then the mother in this case and again this this could vary based on the individual is more compassionate like doesn't like things to be harsh doesn't like the kid to, to, to suffer so the kid does something um, so you're, you're predisposed uh, for compassion so you got the mother uh, in this case, and so the kid does something uh, wrong. Let's say, what does he do? He uh, runs in the house. One of the rules is not to run in the house. Um, he runs in the house, and uh, maybe he generally forgot, maybe, maybe he didn't. But the dad immediately goes, hey, I'm not running in the house. Uh, you broke the rule, uh, go on timeout, or whatever. But the mom's, mom uh, steps in, or maybe the dad's not there, uh, uh, the mommy that steps in or the dad's not there and the, and the mother goes, well, uh, you, pro you probably just forgot or, uh, um, you know, don't do it next time. Next time you'll be in trouble or whatever. Uh, sort of, um, I guess, is predisposed to go to the, uh, 
it's okay. I, I, I forgive you. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, to, to make you feel bad or, or make you suffer, you know, this time out or whatever. And, and, and so lets the kid go, right? That's a good example of a, of an instantaneous intuitive sort of uh, approach. And that's how it would be, by the way, if in this case, the mother was more on the compassionate side and the father was on the less compassionate side, uh, the, the mother would be much more likely to, uh, not want to follow through with punishments because she doesn't enjoy uh, making people uh, cry or suffer even if they did something wrong because that wasn't that big of a deal or oh they probably just forgot it, or whatever. Um, and that might, might be fine uh, in one instance but if you keep doing that across time the kid's actually going to learn that oh well if I break rules uh, I don't get punished that often or uh, if I put up a make a big fit uh, my mom feels bad for me and she lets me off or doesn't do it the next time or, or whatever and so what that ends up doing is that kid learns that <clears throat> their mom's a pushover. Uh, or, you know, in case, let's say it was the father was the compassionate one, that he'd be the pushover. Whoever's the compassionate one, oh, they're a pushover. I can take advantage of them, right? And then they go and they take these tendencies out into the world. They take advantage of the friends around them. No one likes them because then they're, they're selfish. They're not afraid of rules. And when people try to enforce rules on them, they're not used to actually being punished for that. Um, so that they resist as the authority and uh, they go through life struggling um, uh, because somebody is, a parent in this case, is abiding by their, their predisposition for, for, for compassion and not wanting to punish. Um, they actually end up uh, ruining the kid uh, as they go through life because teachers and other kids don't like them. Uh, so they have less opportunities, less friends, they're more antisocial behavior, they're more likely to drop out, become delinquents, all that stuff. And we know this uh, based on uh, psychological studies. So the example of how we actually operate would be the mother uh, favoring, or the father if they were compassionate, uh, favors uh, the compassion route and any evidence that they can find that supports this like any book or article written by a journalist or any study or whatever they can find that uh, supports this you know compassion let your kids figure things out for themselves sort of thing don't punish them it hurts their creativity whatever it might be uh, they're gonna be like yeah see this is why I do this and even if you have an overwhelming amount of evidence uh, on the contrary which is what we actually have uh, that no, if you go too far to the compassionate side, you end up creating a, a narcissistic brat that no one likes and has a, has a bad life as a result. There's, there's much more of a balance. I'm not saying, of course, be totally strict and have no compassion, but there's certainly a balance to maintain there. Uh, the evidence is overwhelmingly in support of that. An example of that would be, even though the mother does this initially, maybe the father points that out or somebody else points that out or she discovers it herself or whatever, um, even though they feel this way, they, or if it was the father, whoever it would be, that's the compassionate one, they actually uh, realize at some point, whether it's through debate or seeing somebody else or seeing all the studies that support having structure and, and some degree of discipline, uh, realize that, uh, that too much compassion is actually worse, actually damaging. So even though they feel like that's the right way to go, and in, in fact, maybe enforcing the punishment feels wrong and makes them feel bad about it, uncomfortable, they don't want to do it, they actually know, you know, based on other opinions and the criticisms of others or, 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 or the father's perspective or whoever's perspective or just the articles that they've read in support of um, balancing compassion with, with discipline, um, that uh, they can change their behavior. So even though she might initially feel that and maybe forever feels that, that hesitance to punish because she doesn't like it, um, uh, she's actually going to sort of rationalize, uh, or sorry, reason and, and, and muscle through that, mentally anyway, uh, and go through the punishments because she knows, even though it goes against her intuitions, that it actually is the right thing to do uh, as far as having a, a, a more likely positive outcome. So they could uh, consciously override uh, intuitive uh, reasoning. All right, and that's difficult. So first of all, you have to have an alternate opinion. So you need to have somebody else, whether it's a father or another mother or a grandfather or grandmother, whoever it might be, or just a series of articles or a video, whatever it might be. You have to have another opinion that, that says you might be wrong. And then you have to be willing to listen to it because she could just succumb to this you know, confirmation bias and exclude it and only choose the articles that maybe even if they're not reliable, they happen to support her view and she says, well, look at all these reasons why I should do this. 
and goes forward with it. So it's hard to do. You have to be open to the idea you might be wrong, and you have to actually listen to what the other side says and then try to objectively look at it. But that's really, really hard to do. So hopefully knowing that going forward, if anyone listened to this entire video, hopefully knowing that going forward, you realize that, oh, I actually um, do often make decisions instantaneously and intuitively. And I might not actually be right. I might actually be just rationalizing my own bias, and I might actually be excluding information that is um, against what I say, even though it might be right. And I might actually have to realize that I'm wrong, and my intuitions might be wrong on a given subject, and I should consciously make the decision uh, to not do that, even though it feels uh, wrong, per se. So that's, that's what Hyatt discovered. And that actually explained this uh, right here, the inconsistencies. Uh, so even though Kohlberg did lay out this plan of, of understanding, constructing these, these rational moral systems and analyzing them and getting on the social contract, even a universal ethic in stages five and six, uh, Haidt does a great job of explaining why people don't abide by that uh, and why they can't, um, at least not without some sort of awareness of this intuition bias uh, and this confirmation bias. And then of course, uh, um, it requiring a great deal of effort and understanding to override that consciously and actually change your behavior to be more practical or rational based on um, uh, the relevant psychological liter or even personal experience if there's no letter literature to uh, to base that on. So that's moral development and that's uh, that's Kohlberg, his critics, and of course our uh, modern updates to moral psychology.